In case you missed it, 2020, part two. This one is about the numbers and the fear. I'm going to run down what we know so far, what the media is telling us and what the people believe. First, let's look at some of the raw stats so that we can reduce the hype as much as possible. As of last week, the CDC recently revised its death rate estimate down to just 0.4%. That means even the mainstream media states that the death rate is far below 1 in 100 people, which is what was proposed back in February. Keep in mind, that's all demographics combined. Right now, 1% of counties in the country account for nearly half of all virus deaths nationally and only 10% of counties account for nearly 90% of all deaths, which means that in nine out of every 10 counties, almost no one is even claimed to have died from the virus. In fact, roughly 30% of all the counties in the United States haven't experienced a single virus-related death. Let's look at the age demographics. Most people know that senior citizens have been mentioned heavily by the media since day one, but as of late, no one wants to focus on this age group, and you really should. Keep in mind, these numbers are endorsed by the CDC. Nearly half of all virus deaths have come in nursing homes, and almost all of these people have had underlying conditions, meaning they had potentially terminal health risks before the year even started. To that point, 94% of all virus deaths have had at least one other underlying medical condition. But you know what? Back to the demographic. More than 80% of all virus deaths are among those over 65 years old. No real surprise there. People under the age of 55 account for just 8% of all virus deaths. Makes sense, right? However, if you are 34 years old or younger, your probability of dying from the virus as of June 3rd was 0.0005%. But most American schools are either part-time or virtual or just not reopening. After European schools reopened, there was no observable increase in virus cases. So why all the hysteria over here? The American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Academy of Sciences concluded that children can safely return to school, but the teachers' unions don't care because many teachers are in the higher age brackets, which means increased risk. Well, at least perceived risk, depending on what media source you're listening to. And the media isn't even disputing all the numbers I just rattled off. You can break them down as you see fit, but to me, they just confirm what I've been seeing since January. The hysteria simply does not match the situation. It didn't then, and it doesn't now. However, old tricks are the best tricks. If you tell people to panic over and over on all channels, then it will sink in and the masses will panic just because they were told to. Or to put it another way, tell a child every night that there is a monster in their closet and they will see it fear it, and will be willing to change their lives around it. Perception of the risks of the virus are now so exaggerated that it demonstrates how fear has become the only true enduring reality of the pandemic. The gap between the reality and perception around the risks, in some cases almost a factor of 100, shows how state-sanctioned fake news has come to dominate the public imagination. Case in point. A recent research study was done called COVID-19 Opinion Tracker, published on July 27th, 2020 by Kext, CNC. The survey was conducted between the 10th and the 15th of July. In the perception versus reality section of the survey, 1,000 adults were questioned in the UK, USA, Germany, Sweden, and France. The report shows that across the five countries in which the survey was conducted, people, without exception, think that the risks from the virus are far more widespread and dangerous 
than even the reported figures. Two questions were posed which required them to fill in percentages. How many people in your country have had the virus? And how many people in your country have died from the virus? The results are astonishing. To the first question, related to the numbers who have contracted the virus, we call them cases, people in the UK said 22%, four times or 400% higher than official figures. In the USA, they said 20%, 20 times greater than confirmed cases. In Sweden, they said 16%, also 20 times higher than confirmed cases. In Germany, they said 11%, 46 times greater than confirmed cases. And in France, they said 12%, again, 46 times higher than confirmed cases. On the numbers of deaths, the figures were even more exaggerated. In the UK, the response was 7%, 100 times greater than confirmed deaths. In Sweden, they said 6%, also 100 times greater than confirmed deaths. In France, they said 5%, again, 100 times greater than confirmed deaths. You see where this is going, right? In the US, where the media is even more intense and results are posted 24 hours a day, the answer was 9%, 22 times greater than the confirmed deaths. Germany, however, has the greatest difference. Their answer was that 3% of their population had already died from the virus, which is 300 times greater than even what the media is reporting. So in real terms, the public in the UK thinks 4.6 million people have died from the virus, rather than the actual deaths, which then was 46,000. In the US, where reported deaths are actually posted on every major media network every day, the general public believes that 3 million people have already died from the virus, even though CNN said it was 150,000. You want to see the power of perception? Here it is. Mainstream told your friends and neighbors that people were dying. And like all rumor mills and gossip chains, the public ran with it. Almost to the point where they currently believe that there are bodies stacked in the streets like firewood. This leads us to the inevitable vaccine that will be rolled out within months. Will the majority of the population take it? Six months worth of fear should be enough to do the job, but as you probably guessed, there were backup plans created. I direct you to clinicaltrials.gov, the full link pasted here and in the comments section. It's called COVID Vaccine Messaging. For this one, there are several. The sponsor is Yale University. You can read it for yourself, but I'll give you the highlights. It's a simple study on how people react to different messages promoting the vaccine. It uses all the current marketing techniques and goes something like this. They create 12 groups of people. Group one is a control group, which is basically told nothing about the vaccine. Group two is the baseline group. They are generally informed about the effectiveness and safety of vaccines. Group three gets a personal freedom message about how the virus is limiting people's personal freedom and by working together to get enough people vaccinated, society can preserve its personal freedom. Group four gets an economic freedom message about how the virus is limiting people's economic freedom. And by working together to get enough people vaccinated, society can preserve its economic freedom. Group five gets a self-interest message about how the virus presents a real danger to one's health, even if one is young and healthy. Getting vaccinated against the virus is the best way to prevent oneself from getting sick. Group six gets a community interest message about the dangers of the virus to the health of loved ones. The more people who get vaccinated against the virus, the lower risk that one's loved ones will get sick. Society must work together and all get vaccinated. Group seven gets the economic benefit message about how the virus is wreaking havoc on the economy. And the only way to strengthen the economy is to work together to get enough people vaccinated. Group eight gets the guilt message. It asks the participant to imagine the guilt they will feel 
if they don't get vaccinated and spread the disease. Group 9 gets the embarrassment message and asks the participant to imagine the embarrassment they will feel if they don't get vaccinated and spread the disease. Group 10 gets the anger message and asks the participant to imagine the anger they will feel if they don't get vaccinated and spread the disease. Group 11 gets the trust in science message. Vaccination is backed by science. If one doesn't get vaccinated, that means one doesn't understand how infections are spread and possibly ignore science. Group 12 gets the not bravery message, which describes how firefighters, doctors, and frontline medical workers are brave. Those who choose not to get vaccinated against the virus are not brave. And there you have it. 12 different ways to market a vaccine to a population that has already been softened by months of fear. Whatever group resonates the most will be promoted more repeatedly, but make no mistake, all will be used in the next year. Be aware of them and be willing to respond to each because your friends will bring one of these arguments to you. Let's end with this. People around you might wring their hands and stay up at night because they worry about scary numbers and dead shadow puppets. You can sleep soundly because despite what you might read or hear, there are no monsters in the closet. (laughs) 